You're listening to Filling the Storehouse Podcast. I'm David. And I'm Stuart. And we want to walk with you on the journey to living the abundant life through faith, family, and freedom. Our goal is to refine our why while helping you find yours. Together, achieve our best and highest purpose. In the end, we'll drive each other to intentionally fill our storehouse. Hey, hey, this is Stu. And hey, did you know that as of 2016, there are more than 40.6 million people in modern day slavery and that the business of human trafficking creates over 150 billion in profit every year. Yes, that's billion with a B. Human trafficking is a global crime that is woven into our lives more than we realize. Trafficking happens every day all over the world and it affects individuals of every age, ethnicity, and socioeconomic background. Well, our, our friends at Exodus Road say that we believe that justice is in the hands of the ordinary people just like you. And everyone has a role to play in bringing freedom to traffic sons and daughters around the world. And so do we at Storehouse 310 Ventures. This has become a passion of ours to support Exodus Road and fight this hideous crime. So we've created the Storehouse Giving Fund. It's a donor advised fund. And uh, we hope that us ordinary people can all come together and fight this ridiculous, hideous crime. So join us in the fight against human trafficking. I've put a link in the show notes of this podcast episode to our giving fund. And we would greatly appreciate it if you helped us and just donated a little bit. Seriously, everything, even the smallest amounts count. So go enjoy this episode and go to that link in our show notes and support us and support Exodus Road. Go fill your storehouse. See you. All right, so um, we have two Davids on today's podcast. So let's set some ground rules right from the very beginning of this thing, okay? So if I say, hey, David, that means I'm talking to David Zach, Remedy Drive, lead singer, awesome rock star guy. Uh, That's David, right? And if I say, hey, Dum Dum, that means... I'm talking to you, David Gutierrez. Yeah, my co-host um, on the podcast. Yeah, is that, yeah does no, that that's work? good. That's does good. That yeah, that works. And then uh, David, cool rock star, awesome dude. Um, if you just want to refer, most people refer to Stu. Most people don't know this, but as as Stinky Pot. Okay. Stinky Pot. <laughs> wow. We're off to a good start here. Yeah, <laughs> that's what we call Stuart. That's uh, uh, it's, it's something everybody always calls him. It's uh, you know, huh. that's his handle. Yeah. <laughs> Stinky pot. Really? Stinky pot. Yeah. Oh, okay. I didn't just make that up. That was, oh, okay. that's, that's been your name. 25 years I've known you. Stinky nice. pot. Nice. Well, David, it's, uh, it's great to have you on, man. We were just talking ahead of time. Um, you are, uh, uh, you know, a, a part of, uh, this, this, uh, exciting journey that with Exodus road and, um, you are a part of Remedy Drive, and uh, we lo- we want to get into your story. And one, we just we're really excited to have you on the podcast, man. Thanks for uh, um, joining us. It's uh, great to talk with you. And um, if you could, man, just give us a little backstory about uh, who you are and 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 what you're doing with Remedy Drive. Um, I am David Zock. I grew up in Nebraska. Uh, I started my band with my brother Philip when we were in high school, and then roped our other brothers into it. Uh. And we're, I stayed independent for most of my career. Um, I never grew up with an emphasis on justice issues. Um, but I always found myself drawn to it over the years in little ways where my wife and I would, um, you know, privately contribute to different organizations we really believed in that were doing cool things. Or the band every now and then would do a a benefit concert but in the middle of uh all of our success um what we were hoping you know the success we were always hoping for i just felt an incredible sense of conviction about what i was living for and uh so that's that's kind of a a real short abbreviated history of everything that led up to uh to meeting the exodus road but i have three kids my kids are 16, my boy is 16, my daughter is 14, and my other daughter's 11. You're in the mix, man. You're in the teenage mix. 
Yeah. It happens that in quick. and of itself could be a ministry. And uh, I'm sure there's tons of music you can make just from, just from that experience. I wish that I would have paid a little bit of attention to um, somebody that had kids like teenagers. Cause there is like a, there is a, such a sorrow about kids growing up. Like it is such a different thing that I just kind of thought I'd be strong enough for, but it hit me hard having them, you know, when your 14 year old girl no longer comes and initiates cuddling on the couch anymore, like that's a big loss. And, and oh, don't say that, man. Don't say that. My, I have a seven year old. I'm not looking forward to those days. No, you need to hear it. Like you need you to do. lean into it a little bit. Otherwise it's just going to punch you right in the face, like right <laughs> yeah. in the face out of nowhere. Uh, yeah. No, it's, you know, it's funny you say that. Cause I just recently, uh, I think probably two weeks ago, you know, our bed, I have three, two, I have three children as well. Uh, yeah. Oldest is just turned 11, my daughter. And then I have an eight-year-old boy and a five-year-old boy. And, you know, it, it hit me the other day as I was, I was getting frustrated because sometimes our bedtime routine takes, you know, I'm like, I just want some time at night just to sit down at before 930 and just like whew, compress because the bedtime routine takes long and every kid wants to snuggle. And it just hit me, dude. I'm like, man, this is going to pass so quickly. Like it is going to pass so quickly. So I put a reminder on my phone that bings it every single night at like seven o'clock, snuggle your babies, snuggle your babies. Cause you know, I just want that in my head to be like, dude, this is gonna like my daughter right now. She's still very much initiate that. Are you going to snuggle? And I'm like, yeah, but only five minutes or whatever. But then I was like, dude, this is going to be gone. And then I'm going to be sad crying in my room and my pillow. My kids are going to think I have a problem because I'm crying every single night. Yeah. (laughs) And they, and they get, like that my kids like realized it later on and so they make like this intentional effort but it's not the same you yeah. know what i mean like that intentional effort of like well dad's gonna be depressed if we don't like hang out with him at night <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's not the same as like coming home dropping bags and running to hug dad you know yeah but so i wish i would have read a book or something like just to prepare myself M- mitchell's verse machines is fantastic it's uh it's a bunch of animators that did the the Spider-Man animation, and that's helped me a lot. Like I cried all the way through that that film. But I mean, if you got kids coming up, man, prepare yourself. I just felt invincible because I was. It just came out of the blue, though. That's funny. That's where I met in life, and we just got back from a little family trip where I got sunburned in in Florida. Working on my. I got a, an 88 Bronco for my son, Jack. Nice. It's got a little bit of rust on the hood and the front, and then we're tearing out everything inside and, and uh, just, we're going to make it nice together. What a good, what a good project. Is it stick stick shift? No, sadly it's, it's automatic. Oh uh, yeah. I'm trying to find a stick shift already. Cause I want my kids to have that life skill, but uh, yeah, it's important. Yeah. I well, am, hey, Since you said that I cut my wrist when I was on the job, right? right around the time where the band went full time and it was, I was washing windows Mm. as I think I was 22 maybe. And my partner, Mike, I was trying to, I was a driver, but I couldn't, I had to hold this. Like I had to hold my wrist tight because it was just shooting out if I didn't. Uh, And so I'm trying to like start the shift, the stick shift with my other hand. And this guy, Mike, couldn't figure it out. So I literally was jogging to the hospital and I got picked up. Oh, no, dude. Picked up in a van by the mom of a fan of the band, which is kind of cool. This van saw a guy running, bleeding, and took me to the emergency room. (laughs) Saved my life, maybe. So learn to drive a stick, kids. Do it. Yeah, that's right. Dude, well, Stu and I were stationed in Italy together. and, um, And I grew up driving stick. But that was a life skill that so many American adults mm-hmm. didn't have in Europe was, you know, you want to go like tra- travel somewhere. You want to rent a car. You, you're paying a premium for an automatic. If oh, you just knew how wow. to drive stick. You're paying a, a, you know, but nobody knew how to drive stick. So I literally was teaching. I was teaching nurses and uh, uh, some guys that worked for me, fully grown adults how to drive yeah. stick on the base. Cause they're like, I just want to wow. know. And I'm like, I'll teach you how to drive stick. It's, you know, but it's so funny. It's a, it's a life skill. So that's completely not what we intended to talk about, but, but Hey, for our listeners out there, if you don't know how to drive stick, fix yourself. And if you have kids, I don't know about good luck finding a car that's stick shift still that you can yeah. teach your kid how to drive. <laughs> well, Hey, you, um, can you tell us a little bit about, about the band? You know, you're, kind of the music you you originally started playing. And then as you know, these last few years, you guys released this trilogy, very specific, very 
um, intentional and, and some of the things you alluded to as far as human trafficking, but you know, it, it was that was the, was the, um, I guess the, the changing of that band one, I'm curious if your brothers, I don't realize a family, you know, all family, but are they as passionate as you are? I'm assuming yes, but I don't know if they are also involved with Exodus road and some of the undercover stuff you guys do, but so that's one question. And then two, has it been almost like a spiritual journey that as you've continued to grow, evolve, and, and that the, the music has, has followed that same path? My brother, Philip is the only one that still tours with me and he produces all our records. He's produced this last trilogy of counter trafficking albums um, that started in like 2013 is when we started recording before we met Laura and Matt Parker from the Exodus road, which was, um, this amazing convergence of our paths. Uh, they knew of my music already from the radio. Um, but Phil's come over with me. My wife's come over with me once. So he's got to see what we're singing about, what we're writing about. And there's always been a temptation um, uh, in Christian music to be dishonest about the way the world is, to candy coat and sugar coat things and to turn a blind eye to injustice. And so coming out of all that in 2013, um, it was important to me to be honest. Like I, I, I believe strongly, I forget who said it, but hope has two daughters, anger and courage, anger about the way things are and courage to do something about it. So I don't believe it's, it's, it's a temptation to have a fake hope, uh, uh, a false hope, an uninformed hope. And I spent my whole career singing about hope. Hope's not giving up is a lyric hold on daylight is coming the darkness must perceive the dawn and all of it was was real um but i'd never applied that to the way the world is because i've always kind of been content about the way the world is because it's set up to benefit me and i benefit from the way the world is so joining the parkers and the exodus road for the first time and seeing um the way the world is for the majority of people in it was really staggering for me and for my faith, to be honest with you. Um, and so my songs are coming from a place of doubt. My songs are coming from a place of fear and from a place of hope. And I, and I believe that hope still is that underlying current of the music I'm writing and the melodies that come out. Uh, but it's a more informed hope. And I, and I think it's a more honest hope. Well, you're you're more than just um, you know singing singing songs right about this stuff. You're more than just like a, a rock star that's that's just you know writing writing lyrics and talking about this stuff. Like you're actually going and, and you're in the thick of it. Like you're going and doing this stuff. And um, you know what you can talk about. Um, if you could kind of tell us one why why you decided how and why you got started doing the undercover stuff with, with Exodus road and um, how that's impacted your music. When I met Matt, he came to town, he wanted help raising awareness and raising funds, which I, I was committed to. Um, but when I'm hearing a guy that has three kids talk about putting his life at risk, going into dark spaces, helping support the work of amazing national operatives in thailand specifically um and india i was just moved in my heart of hearts that why can't i do this and what right do i have uh with my platform to merely use my platform to merely use my melodies when i'm asking people to do something that could be their life's work but also could actually cost them their life and uh, that feeling that I wasn't able to put into words then that I'm starting to be able to put into words now was just so strong. And I said to him, can I go with you? And he said to ask my wife. And my wife and I talked about it. She was very hesitant. And I told her at the end of that conversation that I set up a meeting for Matt to come over to our house the next morning <laughs> for breakfast. Nice. Uh, so she was... Um, immediately uh 
about halfway through breakfast, like she said, David's going to join you and this will be our legacy. So that's how that's it awesome. started for us. Go ahead, Dave. I know you had a question. Well, I was just going to say, you know, and, and, and I was really moved. I'll tell you, uh, preparing for the podcast, cause you know, Stu and I were joking that I don't think I've listened to any new music, uh, for or really much music at all for the last you know four or five years with we just listen to podcasts and and yeah but but my family is a very musical family we love music no talent on my side it's just we love we're passionate about it and uh a lot of dancing a lot of singing but as i was listening to your songs and and um going to your website and hearing your story you know and i would encourage everybody to go to remedydrive.com and listen to some of these YouTube because you 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 so artistically and beautifully frame the trafficking experience that you beautifully frame something that is absolutely dark and mm-hmm. it's very poetic the way you describe um, you know these these young women being sold and and your experience with that. But I also love the story about your wife, man. Like you know, it's it, I was getting really choked up and emotional because I have three kids. You know, we're getting out of the military and and it's just kind of ingrained in us to you know, services and grain and, and adventure. I'm not gonna lie there. There was as, as terrible as war is, there's an element of service and sacrifice and putting yourself in harm's way that, that is appealing to, 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 I'd say to a lot of military guys and gals just where we're built, but this resonates so much, but that conversation with the wife, man, we are always talking about like, that's going to be the toughest, that's gonna be the toughest part. Cause Matt's like, Hey guys, you know, come join Delta team or whatever, it is, you know, whatever. Yeah. And he's like, you guys are, you guys got to come do it. And we're like, dude, I would love to do it. But, we got to bring the wife on yeah. such wisdom in that, right. Such yeah. wisdom in talking to your wife. So I, I really appreciate the, the stories and the way you frame them. And, and then that, that, that family element of it. And I think my heart broke when you're talking about, um, I think it was the uh, child soldiers in, um, in Africa. And I believe it was your daughter I was like, dad, yeah. why isn't God not helping them? Yeah. And, and, and it really, created this picture for me. And, and if you mind talking about it a little bit from your perspective, it created this picture of me. And you said one thing you said, uh, when the, uh, it, there'll be a day after slavery is conquered. And you said, when the righteous rose up out of our indifference. And like, I, I kept rewinding that on the YouTube, like I, just to get that ingrained, like that, the power of the indifference and when all it takes is the righteous to rise up. And I'm just curious, long winded way to get to the point is like, how, how did this, you said it was building in you and there's a step right from, Hey, Matt, I want to join you to you're now overseas. Like, how did you, how did you take all of that and, and turn it into action for you personally? Like, how did you make that step, that jump? I'm very delicate with um, using words like calling or uh, putting a, uh, you know, I, I, I feel like that sort of language is abused very often. So I'm really delicate about it. But I do sense, looking back at the progression of this, a an unseen force that was guiding things, that that led Matt to become a fan of my song that was with him in hard times before we ever met each other in person. You know, he, here's somebody that listens to my song when he's going through something difficult in his life. And so at that point, our spirits are already intertwined and leading up to meeting Matt, I had already done an incredible amount of research on slavery, on human trafficking, on child soldiers, like you mentioned, um, Coney 2012, the video made by the organization Invisible Children, that was the culmination of their work for the last 10 years that we had been weaving in and out of and excited about to see ordinary guys from San Diego using their skill set, which happened to be videography, to expose an injustice to the whole world and to end up in the halls of power in Washington, D.C., nudging uh us to, to do something about such an injustice and the tens of thousands of children that were being enslaved. Um, and it came to a head for me, all the studying I had done, all the research, 
I really, it, it was so ingrained in me and it's ingrained in our kids these days and I'm trying to break it. So if I sound strong or too bitter, it's because I'm reacting to a way of seeing the world that convinces good people that want to take action, that their actions should be reduced and smashed and uh, compacted into words. Talking and praying and preaching and singing. And there's a whole industry that benefits by keeping us talking, praying, and singing and, and preaching. A multi-billion dollar industry that a lot of people benefit, including myself. And there is crumbs from the table that are left over to do the work of what Jesus Christ from Nazareth described as good news for poor people. And he came to proclaim that I have good news for poor people as he, in his first recorded public speaking event, he opens a scroll to Isaiah and he reads these words of this ancient prophet that foresaw, looked into the future and saw this thing that was going to be good news for poor people, freedom to captives, liberty for prisoners, a restoration of dignity to, to, to oppressed people and to downtrodden people. And then I, I see this and I read this and I hear those words and I'm like, where's that good news, man? All of, all of it's getting sucked into safe for the whole family, sham religion. That's all about singing and talking and preaching and praying. I want to see the action. And um, I think all that feeling and angst and also my sense of uneasiness about my participation in that industry I mean, here in Nashville, they call it the worship industry. They have a worship industry. That's they, they call it. They actually say those words out loud. It's crazy. Um, when my daughter said, Dad, why not God protect those boys? I wasn't frustrated with, with the creator because the creator set in place a way for these sort of issues to get dealt with and to be impacted. And it's just that the city on the hill has no light. And I don't want to contribute to, to, to that thing that's, that lacks that light. And by no light, I mean, I mean a, it's, it's a diminished candle that's covered with a bushel. Like it's there, but where's the bonfire? Where's the, where's the, the level of response? Um, that a true commitment to this kingdom where the poor and the oppressed and the deserted are found, like would happen at scale. I'm looking for it at scale. And I realized in my daughter's comment, like it just laid me bare. Like, what am I doing? I'm trying to become famous, trying to get my songs on the radio. My marketing director said, David, I'm a whore. I just need you to give me something I can sell. And this stuff's not going to sell. He knows what's going to sell. He does a great wow. job making it sell. It's, you know, the more times you use Jesus in one of those songs, his name, the more it's going to spin on the radio. He knows what kind of music is going to sell. Counter trafficking music is not going to sell. And my Mar uh, my A and R guy said, "But isn't worship singing and all this other stuff you're talking about helping refugees, helping enslaved people, pointing out injustices? That's kind of a distraction. Where if you open to Isaiah, or if you open to the words of Amos, Amos, <laughs> Amos says, ah, I'm kind of tired of hearing you sing. You know, shut up with your songs. I asked you for." For, for justice, and instead you're treading roughshod over the poor. And Isaiah says, um, bring, me, bring me justice, give me oceans of it, and then come and sing. So I was really convicted by all of that. And so I tried in what, whatever little way I can to, uh, to get out of that safe, positive, encouraging, comfortable apathy. So uh, one of my one of my favorite songs is is commodity, yeah. And and there's some lines in there that are specifically talking about what you're talking about here. Is you know you're saying put a pen in my hands, not an Uzi. Put a mm. six string, you know, put, give me a six string, not a six gun. So you know we don't want to go the 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 way of Uzis and six guns. And you're saying we need to do more than just put a pen in my hands and talk about it. So how do how do us ordinary people step into extraordinary roles? You know, hmm. um, how do people that might not have the courage or approval from their wife go actually do operatives overseas, um, take it a step further and beyond just, you know, putting a pain in my hand? Well, the pen is mightier than the Uzi, you know? Very true. Uh, 
I agree. And this movement and other justice and mercy and compassion movements need the currency of our pens for sure. Um, and, and David, I, I appreciated what you said about the way that some of these songs I'm writing are, are, my goal is to like bring beauty to a really, really, um, ugly situation and to remind my own soul of the beauty of everybody involved in this terrible thing and to remind, to remind the world of her loveliness. And that's the currency that I have. I, I'm a lyricist and I'm able to find melodies. Thankfully, I don't know where that comes from, but I'm able to find melodies and I, I, I work hard to try to find melodies, melodies that would do justice to this cause and to, would elevate the cause of a girl stuck in, stuck in slavery in, in Asia or here in the States or in Latin America or wherever she is. Uh, but that's a currency that I have. You guys have today, and when you had Laura Parker on, you have a currency of your podcast. And you're spending that currency on this cause. And I don't have a good answer for you, but I think I have a better answer. I don't know that what the currency that somebody listening to this has. But Isaiah the prophet did say, if you spend yourself on behalf of the oppressed, then your light will rise like the noonday. So yeah. my, challenge, my challenge is, what is the currency that you have? Your voice for sure, because no one else has your voice. You can put divisive and mean things on your front lawn or on the front lawn of your social media platform, or you can use the currency of your social media platform because you're at the pulpit of your digital congregation there. You can use that currency, the currency of your time or your art or your youth or your political capital. You can, you're going to spend that currency on something. And so without a great answer, I like to reference a few people that you guys might have heard of before, like Karina from Iowa that ran a 5K in Stiletto High Heels and brought all sorts of awareness and funds. Or some girls in Minnesota that grew some pepper plants and turned those peppers into pepper jam and then sold that pepper jam to raise awareness and funds for the Exodus Road. Um, there's, I have like a hundred of those. I just met a girl last week in Minnesota, right near Duluth, that has a cake making business that she gives all the proceeds. Saw that. Yeah, that was yeah. really cool. So I'm just trying to celebrate those little things uh, that that people do that are seemingly insignificant. And you might be looking if you're hearing this, you might be thinking, well, this guy has a rock band. He has time and money to to go overseas from time to time. I'll tell you this. Whatever you do is going to feel like a drop in the bucket. And even if you're do, doing, you know, at my level, I seriously feel like what I'm doing is barely moving the needle. And even the Exodus Road is an organization with contributing to the freedom of over 1,500 people. Well, there's 40 million people being exploited and enslaved today. All of it's going to seem like a drop in the bucket, but it's in the collective actions of a bunch of people that have decided to trade in their religion of self-absorbed song singing for a religion of taking the cause of the poor. If that happened on scale, the world would change. I mean, it would change. Yeah, it's it's crazy because you look at, it, it's hard. And this is something we've talked about a couple of times and just the struggle of one, that drop in the bucket, right? If it's a drop in the bucket, then, you know, what's the point? There's 40 million and it's so difficult, but I'll tell you the things that are so impactful are the stories of those of you take each of those 1500 and you take them one by one. Right. And you listen to that story. You listen yeah. to the story of that individual whose life was completely changed. And to them, that is their world. Their entire existence was, was impacted and um, potentially saved by, by these, by these efforts. And it's, it's crazy. And, and the other thing is if, you know, you look at, those who profess to be Christians and love Jesus, if you, if you took all those people and just took a little bit of action, what a huge, it, it would change. Like you said, it would change. It would completely change the world. Yeah. Completely change the world. And if everybody were to even say, you know, give 10%, 10% of 
and, and all people that profess their faith in, in my local church could change the world. Now you multiply that across, you know, every church and every state around the world. And it's, it's, it's pretty powerful. And that's what I love about your skill set. You know, I, I thought it was really funny and I don't, I'm not trying to make fun of you, but, but you said <laughs> you're, you're, uh, in your video, you were like, you're talking about, um, Liam, uh, Nielsen, I always mess up his name, but in the movie, I guess, uh, taken, right. Yeah. You're like, well, I don't possess. I think you said, I don't possess a particular set of skills. You said that those are your words. And I'm like, this guy is awesome like he freaking could put <laughs> lyrics and he can make you know you mentioned lovely right i was listening to that song yeah. because that's the one that um from the human freedom music awards that was a song that that got you guys what's it called the gold mic was that what it was called the yeah. uh, first place for the gold microphone award right yeah and so i was listening to that song and i'm like golly this guy can like <laughs> turn this terrible thing in into an individual picture a picture of an individual and tell her that she's lovely and tell her that she's beautiful. I think you repeated you're beautiful a number of times there and, and, and that that person is lovely. And then that can then inspire people to take action, to do things, to save that person. Like, dude, that is a legitimate skill set, man. Like, don't you, and I'm looking at that. I'm like, man, I can't even like whistle and walk at the same time. <laughs> so I, I want to encourage you in that dude, it is so powerful and, and you hit it on the head. We all have a platform. And yeah. Stu and I have intentionally said like, dude, we don't have this crazy like Joe Rogan following and, and maybe someday God will bless us with something like that only because our intention is to just put out positive stuff to counter all the negative crap you can hear. And, and, and it's very easy to click a button and hear negative stuff. So the, the power of that platform is so, so powerful. And it's just, I love how you, uh, not a, not a really inherent question in that, but but the encouragement to people to do whatever it is. We all have a network, right? We all have yeah. something that we can use to to expand the, you know, to get past this apathy and to take action. Which and is... we could hear, hearing you talk, and I've never said this on a podcast before. I'm getting more and more free with my words. <laughs> but what if, like your church, for instance, what if, you know we expected more of our churches, like instead of two or 3%, which is crumbs from the table towards the benevolence. What if we at least start, I would say 50%, but realistically, what if we just said, Hey, can you put 10% of what everybody's giving you? Not towards salary, not towards a new led wall, even though I have a new led wall behind me, not towards um, a new sound system or a new building project. What if you just take 10%? And put it towards fighting slavery, helping refugees, feeding people, clothing people, visiting people that are imprisoned, and then save that other 90% for the talking part, talking the talk part. But what if we put 10% towards walking the walk? And by walking the walk, I am being specific about the spirit of the Almighty is upon me, and I've been anointed to proclaim good news to poor people. Like, I want to see that good news in scale. And let's start at 10% and let's push it up to 20 like, what if people just said, hey, we're going to give to you. We, we, we like coming here. We like the community groups. We like all this, all this. Your, your worship band's fantastic. Uh, but we want to know that 10% of what we're giving is going to help people with their physical, tangible needs because, because that's mentioned 2,100 times in Scripture. Yeah. Like, what, that would be a really practical way to, to massively impact the counter-trafficking movement, to end malaria, to... to end homelessness in the united states you know to to support and some of that could go to to support the most heroic people in the world are people that do foster care you know so there's so many ways that we could but i, I my frustration is that it's like my kids they see right through it because they they've heard me talk this way but it's easy to be a toad in the warm water where suddenly in my lifetime i'm 43 almost in my lifetime, this thing has turned into this big business mall. And I'm not talking about just mega churches. I'm talking about little country churches too that that have a, you know nothing left over for the work of the kingdom. I'd Is love it? to see that changed. We would too, man. It's interesting. We we actually had um one of our podcasts because was John Reinhardt and he wrote a book called Gospel Patrons. And hmm. he was he was telling us that that um 
United States, Americans are actually the most giving, one of the most giving countries out there. But uh, being the most generous is giving like 2% of, of our average salaries across the United States, you know, versus uh, 10% what, what is charged uh, in the Bible to do. And, you know, so you're right, man, like, what if we just were a little bit more generous with, with, with what we had and, uh, you know, gave, gave it over uh, to amazing heroes doing amazing things. Or not just our, not just our finances, but maybe instead of uh, that extra Bible study midweek, maybe people just go out and serve people instead, Mm -hmm. you know, because what you were describing earlier, David, that longing to serve, um, you guys have had it sewed into you in a beautiful way through a very self-sacrificial service. You guys are together in Italy, you know, you know, helping defend our country. Um, but I don't think that, that it was created in you during your time over there. I think it's innate in you and it's innate in me, the longing to serve, the longing to lay down my life for somebody else, the longing to, um, to be part of someone else's story and it's innate in everybody. And if, if we figured out how to breathe oxygen on that spark that we all have, um, like I have this hope against hope that we could see an incredible change. Well, and I think it's easier. I think it's, it's easier than we think, right? I think people look at, say you go from zero, zero to 10% is significant. Yeah. That's a significant if you're living off of a hundred percent. Right. Um, and I think what, what, you know, as, as you're talking, I'm like, how can we, how can we help this process? And, and I think what it is, is finding people where they are and just adding a percent. And, and you look at someone like Rick Warren, right. And, and for the last however many years, you know, I love how he always talks about, yeah, I just can't, I can't out give God. Like it's, it's, it's getting, it's getting frustrating because he just keeps blessing and, hmm. and he gives, but then, you know, after a number of years of faithful giving and increasing by 1% a year, regardless of your situation, 1%, um, you know, you, you, you find yourself maybe in a position like he's in where you're giving 90% away, 90% plus. And, and it's not a prosperity gospel thing. It's just a faithful uh, drive to what's important and the reprioritization of what's important. Cause we all have these, right? Like, do I want a new car? Like, I think everybody kind of wants a new car sometimes, right? Do I really want a pickup truck? Absolutely. I would love a pickup truck because it helps me to feel like a better man, <laughs> but you know, but the, the, uh, but I just think it's this, this, and what I think is so effective when you mentioned the pen and the songs and the singing, the awareness is that it can just be these incremental things. And if we just did a little bit more and it was always a little, in, in, in flipping on its head, right? Like I, I forgot who they said, hey, when's enough enough? Well, more, right? When are you happy? Well, more. Well, maybe if that's our giving and maybe if that's our service. And I also love how you said, like we can all do something, even if it's not money. You know, yeah. We're struggling with this right now with our family because our kids are really like, for some reason they became, and maybe it's just this constant drumbeat, but they want to feed some, some poor people. Yeah. Like that's what they say. And you're like, okay, let's, let's take action on that. And let's go find, I mean, you can find poor people. It's pretty easy. Um, but it's, but it's doing that and how you encourage it. And, and I tell you, if we could crack that nut, right. If we could crack that, that hard problem and just give a little bit more inspire action, man, it could be so, it could be so powerful. So basically Stu and I are going to come up with a plan for you guys to tour and okay. uh, we'll just go hit some awareness things and, and make it happen, dude. What do you think? I would like that. Yeah. Awesome. I think, I think, I think a basic thing we could do uh, in religious circles is redefine worship as an act of service and not, and, and, and to pull it away from just like, what am I giving to a church building? But, but also, man, I want to give money directly to somebody that's feeding people. And I want to go find them downtown Nashville. And we found a cool place that we get to go to from time to time. People loving Nashville on Monday night, every time. And there's different ones on Tuesday or Thursday. There's people that have an awesome infrastructure set up where they got food and then a, a shower truck now goes. There's like two shower trucks called Shower Up Nashville. And dude, a that'd be perfect, dude. We could get you in one of those showers. <laughs> <laughs> we could finally get it, dude. Yeah, you could use, you could use we'll it personally, tomorrow. man. 
<laughs> I'm glad you jumped right on that. <laughs> so funny. So funny. Hey, David, if you could give us, give us a story of blue. Uh, I think it's an amazing story. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's pretty powerful. For me, the story goes back uh, about eight, eight years now. And um, I met a girl named Manny. And it's hard um, without context for people to quite understand why I'm sitting at a table at an outdoor bar in a red light district in Thailand. But I'm sitting there pretending to be a customer. And it sounds odd, but it's normal for customers to hang out at these places for like an hour or so just talking. And there's hookah. and um, But we're there on mission finding evidence of people selling teenage girls for sex. And Manny was one of the youngest girls I saw that whole trip. And, but then I see another girl coming through with this guy that's taking her upstairs, probably to spend 30 minutes with her or whatever. And I'm like to Manny, I'm like, who's this? She says, far sister, sister. And it's her younger sister. And far was one of the youngest girls I for sure had ever seen. And, um, you know, I don't do, we can't give big tips out of donor money, but I always, I learned from Matt to have a little bit of money set aside if my heart's attached to a certain story that I hear. And these girls' story was so tragic their, that their parents had died and they're being sold in this little, little uh, brothel bar that I was at. And so I gave them each like a thousand baht, which was like $30 at the time. And one of them chased me down, far chased me down, gave me a hug and said, you good friend. And then I said goodbye. Oh, and she also asked me if I knew uh, who, she, she was saying Paul Walker. And I couldn't understand what she's saying, but she's asked me if I knew who Paul Walker was. And so I pulled up that song on YouTube that she wanted me to, she wanted to hear a song and her dad was out. And so she wanted to hear that, that song that they sang when he died. Um, and so like that story of these wonderful, kind, loving, girls just trying to survive um stayed with me and I, I i just get that sense man i wish there was something more for them so fast forward to 2020 a different city in thailand um there was a girl with that same name far that uh for some reason two or three nights we actually met her because we're trying to build a case against a particular trafficking network and without going into the details that would compromise the way we're doing everything we saw her at a club and then me and my friend Nate, who's on the board of directors for the Exodus road, uh, saw her three times and you just, it's, that's very hard emotionally to see someone and then to say goodbye and see them go back to what they go back to and then to see them again and then see them again. And, and she was, she was just clumsy cause she's in that kind of puppy dog stage that teenagers go through when you're like 14 15 16 maybe and um she told my friend nate that far translates to blue in in english and so nate got blue tattooed on his arm and he wrote this beautiful letter that he can't send that sometimes we do because your heart really breaks and you wish you could say things that you can't say because you want to protect the mission and because it would make no sense out of context for the girl to hear these things. But he wrote some really poetic lines and I asked his permission if I could, if I could use some of his lines and turn it into a song. And he said, yes. So that's where, where blue comes from. Yeah, dude, I can't imagine um, just emotionally going through that, right? Like, you know, acting like you're going to be a customer and seeing these underage girls having to, you know, do what they do. And, um, you know, how, how do you, I mean, besides the songwriting is how do you, and how do others uh, that are on the front lines like handle that? We're supposed to be in therapy. Um, <laughs> and I do, I do. I'm, I'm not as consistent as I should be. Cause once again, you feel, you don't like it hits you the night of, and then you're like, well, that was rough last night, but you don't realize it just stays with you. 
and it stays under the surface. It could have the potential to steal my joy. Um, Because I did say in that other song, I'm not free anymore if she's indentured. And there's a sense of profound sadness that sticks with me now. Um, Happiness is overrated, you know, It, it really is. And I do believe, and this was with the help of my therapist, that joy, a requirement and a required ingredient for real joy, for true joy, is the intentional acquainting ourselves with the grief and the sorrow of somebody else. And drawing near to pain, drawing close to suffering, is drawing close to the face of the creator of the universe. Being more and not less like the one who they called a man of sorrows who's acquainted with grief. And the insulated version of Christianity, the safe for the whole family version, the the running from pain, running from sorrow, turning the other way when there's such profound misery is bad for our souls. It really is bad for our souls. And it sounds like an oxymoron, but sorrow is actually really important for our souls. And drawing near to sorrow, to love another person, as the poet Victor Hugo said in Les Miserables, to love another person is to see the face of God. And so I hold on to that, whether or not I believe that's true all the time. I, I know it is true. I know in my head that it's true. My heart doesn't always remember that. So I, I have no problem like knowing, I mean, I have so many friends. I call them friends. Like, and they might hate me, you know, they, they, they might hate me if they knew I was there to try to get them out of this because they're, that's in their minds, their best chance at, at making a living, you know, and sending money home or whatever circumstances led her to be trapped in that brothel. But I know maybe somehow, I don't know how it all works, that we'll see each other on the other side. And I'll be able to say I wasn't who I seemed to be, just like you weren't who you seemed to be. Mm. man i uh it's tough and i knew i was going to get emotional when i was watching your guys's stuff man i tell you uh and one of the pictures that just keeps coming into my head is is um when you were showing you know the footage of the women behind the glass and where yeah. the men sit and they drink and they smoke and then and it's 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 a it's a it's a meat market it's numbered you know we've as human beings have found a way to put numbers on other human beings for our own selfish pleasure and joy. And, uh, that's a, that's a pretty depraved place to be. Um, and so, and that's one of the things we talked to Laura quite a bit about and Matt too was, and how do you, how do you do that? But what's consistent with all with, with everybody who does any kind of, I believe sacrifice and faces and faces the fire instead of turns away from the sorrow is that you can't imagine not doing it. You can't imagine um, not living in that anymore because of the depth of it. And, and from that, you find joy and man, the way you frame that was just was so powerful. And I'm sitting here, like I've got this longing in my gut that I, that we just feel to go towards whether it's, you know, even things like the suffering in, in Ukraine right now. Like I, I look at those stories and I don't think of it. I, I never think of it from political. I never think about it from any president. I think about it from these kids and these women and these innocent people suffering. And what do we do about it? And for us, you know, it's, it's the, the first initial, which is not the right way is, Hey, you know, well, let's you fight and you just, you, you fight. That's what we do We're in the military. But what you're doing is so much more powerful and it, it just pulls. It's it's so um, amazing. And I really appreciate you sharing that because I think that's a part people struggle with a lot is how am I going to deal with this pain? And once my eyes are open, I think there's an intentionality to keeping our eyes closed because we don't want to deal with the truth and the implications of what that means for our life and our comfort and our mental state of being. And I would just... I. I I, I hope people rewind that and listen to when you put yourself in that position. Yeah. Your happiness, which is most likely fake anyways, is, is going to be interrupted for true joy. And who wouldn't make that, who wouldn't make that trade? I would. And uh, so I, I just really appreciate the way you, you frame that. Cause it helps me too. Right. Okay. When we go knock on doors and 
you face these things and you see your children's face and these, and these innocent children's, you know, in their faces, how, how do you move forward? And, and I think it's, uh, it's a powerful picture, man. I'm trying, it's to, a hard, I'm trying to hold it back. <laughs> it's a hard job to do like interrupting people's day with something like this, with your podcast today, with our concerts, with somebody at a, at a soccer game asking me where I was last weekend. <laughs> I'm going to tell them. And I know that by telling them, they're going to respond with a choice. There's an emergency going on. I'm alive today. And my choice is to do something very small and seemingly insignificant or to do nothing. And I have a little bit of power. And what if I hoarded that power for myself? What kind of person would that make me? And I know it's corrosive to my soul. I know it seems like it's life-preserving, but it's, it's poisonous to the, the, the beautiful and the intentional and the fearful design that have, I've been made in this image of love, uh, a self-sacrificial love that is most greatly observed in laying down my life for somebody else. And so it's a difficult thing to call people into because I'm like, I'm, I'm confronting anybody that hears me talk with a choice to do a little bit or to do nothing. And it could end up being really sorrowful for them. It might be, it might be caught like, um, I don't know if you've heard about Drew, but Drew, Drew moved his family to Thailand. He saw us in concert once. He was in the military. He broke his back in Afghanistan in a plane. A uh, copter went down, helicopter went down. And this guy moved his whole family over there. And I'm, I'm thinking, what if, what if they get hurt over there? It's because I recruited him. Or what if my daughter goes over to India and helps re restore and rehabilitate people coming out of this? Like, how am I going to feel if it costs her a life? And it's just a slight adjustment, but it's everything. Like if we claim to follow Jesus Christ from Nazareth, this is exactly what he called us into and commanded us. If you want to save your life, okay, fine. But if you want to follow me, you want to lose your life. And in, in losing it, you're going to find it. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. And Stu, sorry. And, you know, I think, oh, I, don't, I think I don't it's, really have anything to say to that. <laughs> that's freaking awesome. <laughs> Well, as, as we, you know, we're doing this, this Bible study and, and it's been really cool. Um, for the last few years, we've held each other accountable to read through the Bible in a year. And, and when we first did it, it was a check in the block, right? Like I finally did this. I've been trying to do this for two decades. I finally did it. And now we're like on the third, fourth iteration. And this time, this time I'm taking it a lot slower and, and we're in the old Testament and man, it, the things that have been hitting me now are so different. It's, it's just, you know, when you look at a, we were creating God's image. Well, God wasn't this happy. You're not reading, especially in the Old Testament, we're in Kings right now, two Kings, which is <laughs> just the, the depravity of, of after, you know, the line of David. And, um, but when you read it, you're like, man, God, the, I'm not picturing this happy God. And I was creating God's image. And so it's not happiness wasn't the goal. It was righteousness, it was justice. There's anger. God has anger. There's jealousy. There's these emotions that we always attach this negative thing to because it's not happy. Yeah. But but it's but then you see the culmination, the plan, the culmination in Jesus Christ and the the salvation and the sanctification and all these things. And you start to it's really hitting me this time through. Like, man, who am I created to be? And who is this God that I'm created in His image? Because it's not uh, middle-class suburban, uh, white guy who's just, you know, seeking happiness and possessions and material. It's, it's something vastly different, vastly more challenging and vastly more fulfilling. And, uh, I think it's just, uh, you know, having you on today too, as I was preparing for is just all these things are kind of coming together. And I'm like, man, you know, for, and I feel like a lot of people feel the same way, but it's time to do something, right? Yeah. You, you, you got to stop reading at some point. Well, you don't stop reading, but you, you, it, it has to go beyond reading and talking. And and what do you do? And so I'm just curious, you know, when when you see a couple knuckleheads like us, like I mean, what is that? You know, not everybody 
takes their family up and moves to Thailand, but there are things that we can do. And I, and I would just hope, I mean, you touched on it earlier, but just these, these little areas, like how could we support your mission? For example, how could the, the normal person just support your mission? So remedy drive.com slash action um, gives it, gives a number where you can text remedy to that number. If you haven't yet, where, where you'll get updates when the Exodus road contributes to somebody's freedom. And with that right below it, you'll see all these different ways that normal people have answered the question you just asked me. Um, there's a way to contribute financially specifically to, um, to raids and rescue missions uh, that that's on that same link or, or to set up a fundraiser because fundraisers are like grenades. They're awesome. You, you put it into your social, social community and then everybody not only finds out about it and has their heart broken for the issue that's breaking your heart, but they can get involved and, and help your fundraiser meet, meet its goal. But the bigger question that you keep on asking is that gnawing thing. Like that doesn't feel like enough. Um, I want to do more than just leverage my podcast is how you're feeling right now. And I know how you're feeling because I want to do more than just leverage my band. But there is a paralysis from not taking that first step. And I have a strong confidence that if whoever's listening takes that first step and it's going to seem small, and then the next step is going to seem small. As it did for a reluctant abolitionist that had an army bearing down on him, mountains to his back, water to his front and as he took steps forward the waters divided and he led a million people to their freedom and it's going to look different for you than it looks for me because like i said earlier my my fingerprints are different but my fingerprints are on this issue and you want your fingerprints on it even if it's just part of your part of your matthew whatever portfolio where jesus says i was hungry i was sick i was imprisoned and you visited me like i want that portfolio to be diverse <laughs> That sounds, I've never said that before. It sounds kind of cheesy, but it's that's awesome, dude. I love that. I love it. Yeah, I, I want like I want diversity there. I want to I want to be involved in welcoming refugees, and we are in my family. I, and and you might be saying, well, you know, I foster kids, which I will reemphasize. It's the most heroic thing you can do, period. But you can also help in a small way, feeding and clothing and rescuing and rehabilitating. Um, so I know that's still dodging the question. But I still don't have a magic answer for it. Dude, that's that's an awesome answer. Yeah, man. It's an awesome I mean, answer. It's just like you said before, like everyone has their own currency. And if we just yeah. figure out what the currency is and, and use it. Um, but one that. thing that's that's new that I'm saying, and I'm going to add to what I say here, is go lobby your church. Organize with a bunch of other people from your faith community and corner your senior pastor or your board of directors, whoever it is, and say, this is not enough. We're just finding out that we're only spending 2 or 3%. That's not enough. We this needs to change, and it needs to change right away. Like, what do we need to cut so that we can actually have a significant response? That's good. I love that, dude. We we love your music. We love your mission. We love your heart. Um, I mean, it, it's such a privilege to have you on and talk about this stuff. And uh, anything else that we can, you know, tell people to go and check out, listen to, support. I always forget to say it, but I do really love it when people listen to my music. So go find yeah. us on Spotify or wherever you listen. You know, yeah. I, I, I think these songs um, are important and I think they'll, they'll, they'll um, feed your soul, which David, you got to listen to more than podcasts. You got to feed your soul too. listen, listen, go listen yeah. to some new music. It's, 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 it's necessary. No, it's right. It's now, true. I was freaking, I was rocking out. I had to resuscitate me on, on like, Oh, nice. On uh, <laughs> repeat this morning, jamming it out, nice. driving my kids to school. So it was, it was good, man. I love that. Good. Yeah. Yeah. I was, uh, you know, titles, words, I was an English major. So I think that's why your words appeal to me so much oh, and the cool. way you frame things. And, and, uh, so when I saw um, Brighter Than Apathy pop up, I was like, I got to listen to that because I guarantee you that's a jam. I just, you know, Brighter Than Apathy, that really resonated. Uh, hey, David, I just want to encourage you, man. I think, you know, you're, I thought it was uh, endearing that you, um, you know, your, your somewhat self-deprecating way that you uh, kind of ex you know, express yourself on some of the things that you put out. But dude, making a huge difference, man, huge impact, whether it's, 
music awareness, just bringing joy, hope. Um, I, I just think there's such a such a depth of character that resonates to the music. And, and, and I'll tell you, um, I love what you're doing. And I, I look forward to staying connected. I look forward to Stu and I putting together a, a tour for you. <laughs> Yeah, baby. Let's do it. Um, you know, I, 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 uh, cause we're super passionate about this issue and, and just seeing, just being surrounded by people like, like you and, and the Parkers and just seeing your love for others is, is man, it's such an inspiration. It fires me up. And, 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 you know, I told, uh, I think I told Matt and Laura the same thing, but do you, you're, you're not going to see your true impact till you get to heaven. I'm, I'm confident of it that, that you'll, I think you'll be shocked by those, all those little steps all the miles that you ended up walking in a lifetime and, and those others that you brought with you and, and you pace, you were their pacer and, and uh, um, brought them along. So man, huge encouragement, huge love, and uh, just such gratitude for you to spend some time with us, man. Thank you, David. Thank you, Stu. And Stu's muted. I'm sure he's saying something amazing right now. But... Yeah, that was all just amazing stuff that I was saying. Yeah, we missed, missed it. All. It's gone. Too bad. Sorry. <laughs> no, hey, Go check out Remedy Drive. Go check out RemedyDrive.com. Listen to their music like David was asking for. Um, and if if this meant something to you, hey, share it. Share this podcast. Share their music. Uh, tag us in social medias. Tag David in social medias. And um, let's make a difference. Let's make a decision. Listen to this. Make a decision and go take action. And let's go fill our storehouse. Fill your storehouse, baby. Make it a great day. Thank you. Go take some action. RemedyDrive.com slash action. Slash action. Get some boys and girls, men and women, make a difference. Love it. See ya. See ya. Thanks for listening to Filling the Storehouse. If you enjoyed our show, please subscribe and share it with someone you love. And if you really felt inspired, leave a five-star review so we could continue to grow and help other Christian entrepreneurs fill their storehouse. If you're interested in creating financial freedom through real estate investing, be sure to check out our website at storehouse310turnkey.com. We'd love to serve you through our platform of building the kingdom. Just click on the contact link and we'll reply to you as soon as we can. Again, thanks so much for listening. Now go for your storehouse and make it a great day.